concept of academic dependency is itself a contested concept. So we could have like two extremes in the idea of academic dependency. You could think, we, I'm not saying we could think, there is literature on this <laughs> concept and we have like two extremes. The idea of academic imperialism, so there is a domination of big and, and, and ancient countries in the academic world and that is simply a form of imperialism and there are also many authors that sustain that there is academic or intellectual dependency which is in the epistemological level and this means that peripheries are only like a refraction of what the central countries produce. Well, I, I would like to tell you that I do not share not one or the other. I believe that we have autonomy and heteronomy and autonomy and dependency in every intellectual community, in every academic community. I think that peripheriality has become a very complex phenomenon, so we cannot oppose periphery and center as in a traditional center periphery model and, and imagining that we can put in the periphery or in the center every country we wish. And I think that in that uh, complexity, uh, we, we're, I'm going to try to, to locate Argentina as a peripheral center, a peripheric center. That's something I'm going to explain later. And, um, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe there is a world academic system. I mean, there is an unequal structure of distribution of what we could call the international prestige. So I do believe we have a, an, an unequal distribution of this prestige. And I also believe that periphery, the concept of periphery in academic terms, and uh, uh, centrality, peripheriality or, or marginality and centrality, or marginality and mainstream, have also been built together. I mean, in mainstream uh, circuits or mainstream journals have also been built to the idea of separating themselves from what they call the periphery. In general, Argentina, which is the case I am going to present here, is what we call a peripheral center because it has like a double side. It is dominating in the region, such as Brazil or Mexico or other important uh, countries in Latin America, but it, it is dominated in the inter this international or world academic system. Now, it, it has many, many features that can uh, describe the Argentina scientific field as strong. And especially this uh, description is made of the scientific uh, policies that it has, has had in the last 15 years. The material resources and the amount of researchers have uh, become four times what they were 15 years ago. And so it has lived uh, such an expansion, a geometrical expansion, that uh, if, if we think in terms of the uh, traditional theories of dependency or I mean the Latin American ones, this would be a clear sign of development. So it is a, a, an academic field that has experienced a very important expansion and growth. Now, what uh, I am going to try to prove is that uh, along with this uh, growth, what we have found, what we can find today is an increase of its uh, structural heterogeneity. This means that now we have a very strong and very developed uh, internationalized elite and a very strong and developed nationalized, nationalized or nationalist elite. And so I took the five more important publications of all these researchers, which makes 23,852 publications, and I, I analyzed them to see well, what, what kind of uh, criteria they had and, and the evaluative culture is imposing them in order to choose this. From all this database, I'm going to give you just one, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to advance just one detail. Of these five publications of all of these researchers, uh, the, the number of researchers or, or individual is 4,800 and something, I have it there. From all these 23,000 publications, if we make an average of five, 
four is in English. And so the, the first conclusion could be, well, everything you said is wrong. I mean, this is a sign of academic dependency. This means that uh, academic dependency is a sort of imperialism and that everybody uh, is writing English. And so it's evident that it's against what you're saying. I'm going to try to prove you that that's, that's not uh, the, the conclusion, that we have a nationalized elite that is also at play here and is very different from the elite that you can you can describe from CONICET, which is the internationalized elite. And so, uh, first of all, it's necessary to, to make some acclaration on, on this idea of language being the main factor of uh, the world academic system, because we have, and maybe you're familiar with that, a lot of uh, authors and, and, and available literature that is on the fact that language is an important side of the world system. And in, in, I was saying that there was a structure of, or, or an, an unequal structure of distribution of this that we could call the international prestige. And this is a historical process, a process that we could uh, locate at least uh, during the, the 20th century, but especially 50 years ago, when the Institute of uh, uh, Scientific Information created Gar by Garfield was founded. When Garfield created what we now know as the Web of Science or this Science Citation Index, the, afterwards the Social Science Citation Index, and we could say that, that uh, academic regions in the world were mapped in the last 50 years. So, of course, if you had a database with most uh, American journals and the, the writing style also was imposed and the language also was imposed, there are a lot of factors that can explain that this world academic system was uh, framed basically on the image of this style of writing and this uh, database that was identified with excellence, universal knowledge, etc. Now, it is in, in important to add some factors. It's not only language, it's not only the, the publishing system and the concentration in, in this supposedly world database. Remember that for 40 years it was the only way to, uh, to have indicators on international science. There was no other until Scopus in 2004 or previously Google Scholar. And, and this is what I call the, the accumulation of scientific capital. But what I'm trying to say is that if we want to work on these uh, inequalities in the world academic system in order to, to leave aside simplifications, we should articulate, and that's what I call the triple principle of hierarchization, language, discipline, and also the institutional affiliation of each one of us uh, or of uh, the country we're speaking about. And the institutional affiliation and the institution itself links us directly to material resources, to the, uh, the fact that uh, the, the differences between one country or the other in terms of scientific policy, etc. And discipline, well, there's, no, I'm not going to expand on this, but there is a lot of literature on the domination with, in between different uh, knowledge areas, such as the exact, exact and natural sciences, and the natural and then the, the very normalized uh, domination of the social sciences. Latin America is not precisely the same case because social sciences are pretty powerful. Now, if we, if we look at this region within, we can see that there is a dominance of the Spanish and this regional circuit uh, within the region, and Argentina is very powerful in that sense, along with Brazil, Mexico, and, and other countries. But if we see it internationally, Spanish is indeed a dominated language. In what uh, concerns the institutional factor and the public policies, I was saying that uh, Latin America is in the forefront of open access and internationally it is a, a very powerful region in this sense. And so uh, what we are trying to explain now in the case of Argentina is what happens in this context with a country that also has a very strong public policy that we could even think that is a very nationalist public policy because of all these researchers that I'm working on, 92% of the whole uh, population of researchers have obtained their doctoral degree in Argentina. So, and the public policy was uh, working on that, that direction. So we have a lot of 
things that uh, point out to a very nationalist type of policy, but uh, the internationalized elite is growing and growing. <laughs> so that's one of the main contradictions that I'm going to try to work here. What we have in, in our country is what I would call a double-headed academic elite. One looking for, for the international prestige and the other one looking for a national and more local prestige. This um, fact that we have, of course, this is an analytical extreme. We have things in the middle. Today I'm not going to be able to work much on what is in the middle, but we have these two clear um, uh, directions within our academic elite. And so in, in this uh, sense, I would say that the internationalized elite is concentrated in CONICET, which is the national agency dedicated to research. This uh, agency was created in 1958. It's pretty similar to CNRS in France. What we have is a very clear internationalized elite that is made of researchers at CONICET and a very clear group of professors that teach but do not uh, get involved in this international type of uh, criteria for evaluation of, of their production. They mostly teach and they teach mostly in the non-metropolitan universities, the uh, provincial universities. So what I'm saying is that this two-headed elite has, uh, in terms of Bourdieu, two different habitus, a local habitus in one way, in one side, and an international habitus in the other. And I'm trying to understand how sociologically, how this uh, got to this place. I mean, why and or how uh, a student finally gets inside this uh, cognizant type of evaluative culture and, and, and style of production, and why others uh, are uh, formed in this trajectory. Conicet has also uh, or has mainly been the, 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 the main uh, institution that has gained in these 15 last years in terms of uh, the increase of um, uh, the amount of researchers, the amount of material resources. And Conicet has a system of uh, stratification, <laughs> classification or categories uh, of, of its career. And um, in this career, we have the assistant researcher, that's the lowest. Then we have the adjunct, the, the one that goes after that, independent researcher, the principal researcher, and the superior. What is not possible is for a professor from the university with no doctoral degree, no publication, not publications, to go inside CONICET and win a full-time researcher post. So migrations are mostly from the CONICET to the university and the pressure of the CONICET researchers to get inside a teaching post, but it's more difficult for a professor with, uh, without these um, features to uh, win a post in the CONICET. And so uh, we, if, if we talk about the classifications of the CONICET researchers, now I should tell you how you uh, classify the teachers, because there is a national classification and this is uh, mostly accepted by all the teachers. This is called the national system of incentives. The professor system has five categories and they are numbered from one to five, being the, the number one, the most important. And if you compare, that's what I've been doing, I'm, I'm not going to be able to empirically show you this because it's not this study, but I've been comparing the curricula of the category one that are professors but are not CONICET researchers, comparing with the high categories of CONICET re researchers, which are not professor or, or are not mainly professors, and the differences are really very important. In the CONICET researchers you have PhD, is a requisite, uh, absolutely indispensable. You have publications in indexed journals and with impact factor and uh, with uh, very well ranked. You have uh, these international publications and in the case, and, and you can have teaching of course uh, as a complementary activity, but it's, it's not uh, important in the scores. It's, it doesn't have even a score when you're promoting in CONICET. Instead, in the categories at the university, uh, first category or second category, does not need to have a doctoral degree. I mean, you are going to have some points because there are a few points of the 100 points, but it's not really relevant. You can, uh, your research background is not really the most important thing, but your teaching background, 
and there are, uh, the, the publications are scored, but not according to the indexation of these publications. Clearly the opposite as in CONICET. In CONICET, indexation has replaced the evaluation of the quality. If the journal is indexed, indexed it, uh, the commission, the evaluative committee considers that as a good publication and that's all. Instead in the universities, I, maybe they don't read either, but they give scores to every publication in the country, out of the country, in the same way. I mean, they don't have to. They don't. They don't look at what type of journal they, they are. They have been published, and after we have points in this score that uh, absolutely no Conicet research could ever uh, imagine or, or gain, which are first of all management is very well uh, ranked for a professor. So if you've been a dean or you've been a part of the council that has important scores. Now, I was saying that we have these two sides, and I, I, I was going to try, in order to answer to the colleague's question, to try to, to demonstrate that we had a lot of things in the middle. Well, one is the one I, I advanced, which is what I would call maybe the elite of the elite, which is a mixed profile, and it is the people that have been formed in the University of Buenos Aires. And one of the findings of, of this work is mainly the importance of the national, this national university in general in the international. If we take all the professors that are category one and two in the whole country, which are not here because I'm, I'm, I'm going to work only on the internationalized elite in this work, but these are 4,500. 4, of all of them uh, formed, uh, I, I mean, uh, having gained their doctoral title in the University of Buenos Aires, you have it 16% of all the professors, right, that are category one or two. But if you look at CONICET, and that's what I'm, I'm putting here, CONICET researchers with a doctoral degree obtained at the University of Buenos Aires, the total is 7,900. That is my population of Conicet researchers. It's just that the empirical work on the publications is, I'm going to explain, in a subpopulation. But of all current uh, Conicet research is really a very important uh, amount of, in, in total, it, uh, it uh, rounds the 30%. So it's a lot higher. And if you see it according with the scientific area, it could be even higher, for example, in biological sciences and health, where you can find the 41.5% of all these researchers who obtain their title in this university. And so it is a, a huge concentration. And I'm not, not talking about Buenos Aires as a place. I'm talking about one institution, right? But what I've been founding in the structural matter of, of, of or side of my work is that the National University of Buenos Aires has a main role in creating, forming this uh, internationalized elite. And if you, if you uh, add another factor here, we're talking about almost social capital. We're talking about uh, what, what we, we could, uh, could call academic power because the composition of the evaluative committees, I, I is, uh, worked on the last 10 years of the composition of all the evaluative committees at CONICET from all the disciplines and the percentage of the um, people from the National University of Buenos Aires arises, uh, are, um, rises to 45%. So the presence of this university in terms of the construction of these uh, careers and the building of the prestige in general of the, this national agency is really very important. What we have in, in the formation of this internationalized elite is a, a particular savoir-faire or savoir-vivre in terms of Bourdieu that is formed in this university, that is a, a type of institutional capital that these people have, and that they have it because not only as an as a institutional capital, as in university power, I mean incorporated in the way they can uh, complete the, form, the applications, in the way they can uh, manage to learn to write a scientific project, in the way they learn to write a paper and the, 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 the social capital they can gain there in order to publish in different journals because they are members of a team, members of a network, and this is 
um, really in a huge distance compared to other universities because I am sure that here in Austria you have the same situation. It's not the same to come to this university than to come to a small university in another province. But the, I think the, 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 the particularity of the Argentinian situation is the amount of concentration of academic capital in this university and the, the, its place in the formation of, of the internationalized elite. So, in the internationalized elite, we have a, a strong, very strong international uh, and in, interinstitutional asymmetry, while in the university system, the, the power of the National University of Buenos Aires has been diminishing in the last 20 years. And that is why in the university system, you can have more chances if you do not belong to this internationalized trajectory, you can have more chances to ascend and to uh, gain a, a full position, right? In other universities, but not at the National University of Buenos Aires. If we go to the Conicet researchers, I uh, obtained the data for uh, the individuals are 4,842. They are all researchers Researchers at CONICET. The total researchers is almost 8,000. But in 2013 and 2014, 4,842 individuals presented themselves to promotion. That's the people I took here. And they had to choose their five more important publications. So the total is these 23,000 uh, publications. And I've made very simple uh, this descriptive, descriptive statistics here. And you can see, in general, I, I already told you, 4.02 is the average of English over five, right? And it depends on the area. On the, I'm sorry, this is by age. And so I, I first thought, well, maybe it's something that uh, age can, can be a... Um, or generations can show me some differences, right? But the truth is we don't have really, really ma major differences. Maybe in the young people there, there is a, uh, a, a tendency more to the English. In the young people from 31 to 44, which is the, the blue one, 4.5 on the five publications are papers. But in the 65 to 85, 3.9 of the five are papers. The rest could be books, chapters of books in general, and uh, some particular things in some disciplines like uh, reg registries of uh, property or some participation in important congress. Now if we see these publications by scientific area, of course I wanted to see what happens with the social sciences and humanities. You can see of course that the social sciences and humanities have a very lower um, average of publishing in English, but it's still high for what I can find in the rest of the professors that I was telling you that are not part of this. In the rest of the professors, it's like an exception to write in English, if you see the curricula, which I've been working on qualitatively and in the interviews, right? So it is still an important part. When I compare the curriculum of the social scientists in looking at trajectories, of course I saw a lot more chapters of books and books. But uh, that's the difference between the two corpus. This corpus of, uh, of material is the moment in which I am going to choose what I think that Conicet is going to reward. And uh, what this shows is the extent of the acceptance of this heteronomous evaluative culture. I mean, if I compare with the curriculum, you have a lot more books and chapters of books, but they think that Conicet is going to reward papers in English, and so the amount is pretty high in the social sciences too. And in within the social sciences researchers, in within and per age, I was also looking for a difference, but you, you don't find many differences in between the generations in the social sciences in terms of publishing in English. What of course you do find is in the style of production. Not in language, but in the style, yes, because in the, in the blue one, which is the 31 to 44, 3.3 of the total five publications are papers. So the young people are selecting clearly papers. And in the, between 65 and 85, you have 2.4. What I did is, to, from all these 4,800 individuals, I selected 50% uh, or a bit more on age, on scientific areas. So, so it is very well equilibrated, this sample that I built. 
because I wanted to work on the journal and the country to try to understand a bit more about the type of publication. And here you have in this sample that of the whole mm, uh, sample of the 7,071 publications, 4.188 are published in the mainstream circuits. And the rest, very, very timidly, you can find the transnational circuit, which is like uh, Dialnet or Doag or any type of uh, publishing system that is an open access and that is the difference with the mainstream. I, I'm only choosing their uh, web of science, Scopus, Google Scholar and in the case of the chapters of books that the social scientists had a lot of these, I also took this work by La Riviere uh, that has uh, appeared last year on the oligopoly of uh, publishing houses in order to try to find the relation between the uh, easy web of science and the publishing houses in order to classify all these publications. And so we have an, an impressive amount of publications in the mainstream uh, circuit, but a, a small a share of the regional circuit, which is very important in the social sciences. The last one is by country, which is interesting also, because here we find that, first of all, Argentina has almost no place, because no Conicet researcher would, would choose a paper published in Argentina for this. And, and you can see it, it's 0.3. The United States has an important place, but it's more important the journals that come from United Kingdom, from France, in some cases um, Germany. And so basically it's United Kingdom on the first place and afterwards uh, France and, and uh, Germany. Even though it is analytically relevant to separate these two profiles that I spoke in the first part, these two sides of the um, academic elite, um, the heterogeneity of the structure of the field is also showing that if that's the idea of heterogeneity, right? It's not a dualism, dualism in terms of our tradition, of Latin American tradition. It's not two sectors that are separated institutionally. We really have a lot of uh, intermediate uh, uh, profiles, but it's not possible to migrate from the, the universities as a professor to CONICET because there is a tendency to the imposition of this heteronomous type of culture. And so I'm trying to I'm, I'm saying that because in in this year 2016 we have uh, every five years the national incentive system is uh, renewed. So you have to present yourself again for these categories. And this year we have to see if this the type of endo endogenous endogamy that uh, characterizes this evaluative culture of the universities can uh, still be in the way it is. I cannot speak with the same empirical data of the professors from the university because this data is very difficult to obtain. You have uh, f 52 universities with autonomy, I didn't say that, and that's very important, institutional autonomy and financial autarky, autarky. they have really a very important tradition of autonomy and so we don't have the same uh, fresh and, and easy data as we have with CONICET. So it is a limit of the research that it is very time consume, consuming to work on the other group, right? Um, but uh, finally, I think that uh, if, if, if on one side of this evaluative culture, the internationalized one, we have heteronomy, and on the other side we have endogamy, which is very clear, I hope I, I could make that clear for you, if not I, I can give you some details. Um, my question or, or my ethical uh, argument or question here, and if you want we could discuss it, is if we, we should in some way nationalize this uh, heteronomy and this international elite, shall we do that? Should we do that? And if we should, if we uh, should internationalize the endogamy? I mean, is that the, the way that a scientific policy should today uh, reflect on this problem? Is that the, the way we could solve these uh, extremes in, that we face?